Well, tell the uh, people out there uh, about your qualifications and, and the kind of um, education you have and the, 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 uh, the places you study and whatnot, just so they understand how qualified you are to, to discuss the issue of detoxification. Uh, thanks, Brian. Yeah, uh, my background is regenerative medicine. I've been studying for the past 35 years regenerative medicine from the point of view of the longest living people from around the world. And uh, when I got sick and started traveling and doing extensive reading, uh, some of the experiences I had were quite uh, sensational. We'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, I'll cover that really quickly, one story in particular, because we're going to talk about Finhorn, I hope. Um, yeah, in one yeah. Of, in, in, in one of my uh, travels, I met a very healthy-looking uh, picture postcard couple from Scotland who were living at Finhorn, and uh, they were just gorgeous people. Not a wrinkle on their face. They had those rosy cheeks. They had uh, beautiful white hair, both uh, the husband and wife, uh, very active, uh, a glisten in their eyes smile on their face and uh, I had a chance to converse with them and because they were permanent fixtures at Finhorn they met a lot of the people coming through for different tours I was on a three-week tour so I was staying there um, learning about the facility for three weeks and I got a chance to have dinner with them one night when the issue of their age came up and uh, this is a time in my life when I had severe hypoglycemia and I was feeling pretty weak and I was young. I was uh, just 20 years of age. And um, they, uh, they asked me if I would guess how old they were. And uh, I was raised with a mother who ran nursing homes. So I had a really good idea about people's ages. And I said to them, I didn't want to guess perfectly. So I said to them, you know, you look like you're 65 and I really was thinking they were 70, but in great health. And they both smiled, and they said, um, here, I'm gonna show you something. And so they pulled a picture out from uh, their one of their pockets, and it was this older couple, much older than these two, and they were hunched over. They, uh, one of them had a cane. Uh, they both had, as I recall, the, the man had glasses on. I, I, uh, I can tell you that they were both hunched over as if they were uh, at least 90. But they looked like this couple, and I thought it must be one of their parents still alive. And uh, I said, well, these look like either your parents or your wife's parents. And they both smiled, and they said, that, that's us five years ago when we first arrived at Finhorn basically to retire and die here in our, tra in our small little trailer. I said, it can't be. And they said, well, here, let me show you our driver's licenses. So they pulled out their British driver's licenses, and they were 95 years of age. So that was absolutely sensational that people could completely recover from severe aging. And um, we'll get into some of the uh, one or two of the other stories that also changed my life. And it was that that kind of experience that I decided to become a doctor. Uh, I started off with, uh, with naturopathy. I, I, uh, I started off with a three-week intensive with John R. Christopher that changed my life. I got very, very ill there with a healing crisis because I was eating mostly raw foods. And uh, it was amazing how my body went through discharging poisons that I had accumulated my entire life because I grew up in a heavy smoker environment with my parents, you know, secondhand smoke, and um, eating a lot of the standard American diet fare. And I didn't realize that when you really start cleansing process, it all starts pouring out. So, <clears throat> um, Brian? to have that kind of... Where, where were we at when, uh, when uh, we, we went on break? Well, the, 
the uh, the trip that I took to Finhorn was uh, a turning point in my life when I had met and chatted with and spent some time with these people that were 95 years of age that had been five years earlier just about ready to kick the bucket and they looked to be an extremely healthy uh, couple of 70 years of age uh, they were extremely active and I thought to myself, boy, that's a really wonderful way to end up uh, retiring, is to have that kind of vibrant, thriving health. And uh, both their minds and their bodies were, uh, would beat out most of the kids today that are running around eating all the trash food that they eat. Well, John, maybe so, we should talk a bit more about Finhorn and, and what this place is. I'm not sure the listeners actually understand what Finhorn is. Well, um, yeah, let's, let's talk about that, but it gets into the reason why that I chose to uh, focus in on regenerative medicine, because with the problems that we're facing today, uh, especially with the radiation exposures that we're all getting here in the United States, and when there's nuclear accidents like at Fukushima, um, these kinds of impacts, I don't see how we can recover from them unless we use regenerative medicine properly. And with the way that regenerative medicine is turning out now, because it was not really even a, a discipline when I first started 35 years ago, it's unsustainable. We're, we're going to be replacing kidneys and hearts and lungs at probably half a million to a million to $2 million a shot. And there are only so many people that can afford those kinds of uh, organ transplants that are um, you know, going to be perfectly compatible, but uh, this is not how the long living people uh, did it. So, um, just in a nutshell, I decided to go back home after I ventured to Finhorn and I went to chiropractic school first. And as I got out, I went on to medical school. Um, later on, as I was continuing to practice, I got into acupuncture. Um, I'd already mastered a lot of nutrition and uh, pretty much kept up with the natural healing tools. Um, pretty much taught as a naturopath, chiropractor, acupuncturist most of my career. Uh, watched my medical colleagues that were of like-mindedness lose their medical licenses and get harassed for using alternative therapies. And I uh, was able to keep myself out of trouble because um, I was more interested in using um, natural means and not striving to be associated with hospitals and, and be in that kind of environment where my peers would um, raise an eyebrow over the kind of regenerative medicine I practice. And I'll give you an example about the power of this regenerative medicine, Brian, and then we can get into uh, what Finhorn was all about. It was just a place where uh, I had a, an epiphany, an aha moment. Um, every day, a healthy 25-year-old, if there is such a thing left in America, will suffer approximately 100,000 genetic errors or injuries or mutations in every single cell of their body. And because they're healthy, at the end of that day, at the end of that 24-hour cycle, they're going to repair those injuries, those mutations perfectly. That is the regeneration effect within. We have that mechanism. There's no laboratory. There's no external medicine. Uh, there's no medical practice that can compete with that. But yet nobody is taught how that works within our body so that we can keep ourselves turning on our self-repair systems at that high rate of speed throughout our entire life. And that's what happened with these people at Finhorn. The, this couple, which were ready to kick the bucket, who were already 90 when they retired in a small trailer at Finhorn, went out and every day they ate the food that was grown there in a very special way. And after a period of five years, their body completely rehydrated, their cellular water completely replenished itself, the minerals that hold that cellular water into a special kind of structure was replaced and they ate certain kinds of proteins which come only from the superfoods of the long living that holds on to those minerals so brian what we're going to talk about 
tonight with regenerative medicine is it boils down to three things. It boils down to a very special kind of protein that we should have inside our cells. And those of us that were not breastfed, like myself, we had a severe deficiency of it until I learned how to make up for it. That's number one. Number two, America's topsoil is exhausted today, completely without minerals for the most part, very little. Over 95% of the trace minerals that are supposed to be in our farmlands are gone. Those organic farms that understand how to put minerals back into the soil, which are rare by the way, they have more, a lot more in the food that they grow. Um, we're gonna talk about a magic tomato that I ate at Finhorn that literally lit up my nervous system all the way into my brain in a way in which I said to myself, oh my God, this is what human beings were supposed to be eating. Wow. And I knew, what it, I knew the taste, but I had never had it before. God, These listen. are the kinds of foods that the long living use to regenerate themselves. Yeah. John, I just want to ask you a question. Was, are they growing the food indoors or outdoors at Finhorn? At that time, they were growing outdoors, and they were also taking food that was organically raised from farms within an hour's drive because they had so many guests and, and students coming through that they couldn't feed them the food that was grown on Finhorn property. And uh, this magical tomato experience that I had, I wrote it in my first book about what, what happened. I was very hypoglycemic at the time when I was about 20, uh, and I was working, I was put to work out in a tomato field. And um, as I was turning with my basket of tomatoes to put into a truck that had just driven up, I popped one in my mouth and the truck driver was coming out. He was just pop coming out himself, he's gonna help me. And he's walking by me and I had this wow experience. Like what just happened when I put this tomato in my mouth? I had never, ever tasted food like this before. And like I just said, I knew that's how the tomato should taste, but it illuminated my cranial nerves, all of the, the major nerves in my tongue and my sense of smell and my sense of taste. Uh, I, I could almost see uh, brighter. Uh, it was, it was an, uh, an enlightening moment. And the truck driver caught my facial expression and because on the way back when he had the other basket, um, I had put my basket into the truck and I had turned to come out and I grabbed another tomato from the other side of the truck on my way back out because I wanted to have that experience again. I popped it in my mouth and I couldn't taste it. I couldn't taste it. And I had this perplexed look in my mouth and the, and the truck driver saw that and he says, yeah, I know what's going on. You couldn't taste that, could you? I looked at him. I was startled. I said, how did you know? He goes, that tomato that you just put into your mouth now, I just had it picked within an hour of what, you know, us standing here from a farm that was located about 20 miles away because we can't feed all the people here at Finhorn. So that's the food that we give you. But the tomato that you just ate when I first saw you, you now know what's hap what the magic of Finhorn is. And I said, wow, yeah. And he goes, yeah. Th and he just smiled and walked off, got in the truck and drove off. So I got from a direct experiential insight what was the magic at Finhorn. There was something uncanny and yet absolute real about how humans should be living everywhere and we're not. We're, we are in a, in, a, in a total state of malnutrition compared to these long living people that exist uh, at least 30 different cultures from around the world that eat this kind of food all day long and their uh, agility, their mental alacrity, their physical fitness, they, Brian, don't start their aging process until they're 90. And it's because of these three things at the cellular level that I just mentioned to you. So that's that's what I'm into. Wow, that's really neat. Uh, so John, this magic, just to clarify for me, this magic uh, tomato, it, it was grown right on site at Finhorn. Is that what made it different? Is that what gave it this incredibly high level of uh, nutrition? 
That's correct. And so I spent the rest of my career looking at how not only that tomato, but all the food grown there, as well as what foods were eaten by all of the long living cultures from around the world, people who, cultures that never met each other, completely isolated, usually in extremely remote locations, who all don't start their aging process until they're 80, 90, 95, even 100 years of age. And that's the specific discipline that I have now brought forward and I'm offering it to anyone who will listen. This is what my website's all about it at um, drapsley.com. You can come and read about it. People can see it and they can get started so they can start putting it into their own homes. Yeah, let me just repeat that for you. It's www.capitaldr.com. Yeah, definitely a place you want to go if you want to stay healthy in this day and age because believe you me we are being inundated with toxins heavy metals radiological toxins you name it yeah okay John keep her going so yeah so let's let's talk about that um, you know there there was a news there was a show uh, on HBO and it talked about uh, the very first pilot that it was it was uh, on it had uh, three professors uh, well actually I'm sorry they were all three newscasters they were anchors of made up mass media um, and and the, these people were considered to be authorities because they reported on the daily news all the time and and some young gal got up and asked them a question because they were that's what they were doing in the audience and they said could you please um, describe to us why you feel that America the United States is the greatest nation on earth and you know, two of the news anchors from different stations gave the, the, the typical, oh yeah, we're cool, we're great because X, Y, and Z. But the third one, who was uh, portraying a, a conservative, got up and said, what are you kidding me? America, the land of the great? He says, let me explain to you. And he went through what is absolutely true about how sick we are as a nation, how we don't rank anywhere near the top in almost any category that you want to talk about. And so I, I give an example on my website, and because we can reclaim this. We have the ability to reclaim this. But people don't know just how sick a nation that we really have and how unsustainable it is and how it's directly related to the food chain and how it's directly related to these three things that I just mentioned at the cellular level, making the minerals, the proper minerals, get into the cells with the right protein and having the, white, the correct water that's in there, which is basically put in there by how much we're breathing, how much oxygen we're taking into our lungs each day by way of exercise. We make water because we breathe in oxygen. Most people don't know that. That's how these people at Finhorn had reinflated themselves from this dried up prunish looking couple who were about ready to pass on. They expanded their cellular structure with water again and this good protein and minerals and they came back to life. Yeah. That's what it's we amazing. need to do. Absolutely amazing. Now, actually I was on, a, on another show last week and we were chatting about Finn Horn. It's one of my favorite topics of discussion and um, we were chatting about elementals, nature spirits. Uh, do you believe that these um, these uh, beings exist and are, are helping to create the incredible um, lush uh, food at Finhorn? <laughs> well, that's an entirely different subject. <laughs> um, well, I'm just curious. I mean, I mean, you, there are other, there are obviously other explanations, but I have seen these things, John. When I was a child, I used to see them at my window at night. So I believe in them. But I mean, if you haven't seen them, you haven't seen them. But I mean, I just I'm just curious as to your opinion. I mean, well, while I was at Finhorn, uh, there was a retired bird colonel. Uh, Finhorn is located, or at the time back in the in the 70s, is 1978. It was located right next door to the uh, NATO's submarine surveillance uh, Air Force Division. And uh, they would send out planes all the time to track the Soviet submarines. Well, one of the colonels had decided to retire, and he moved into Finhorn. And he was um, totally blown away by the fact that he 
was innately a sensitive. And so one of the classes that we took as students, uh, we went into his actual resident quarters. And he began this story about how he had been trained as a biologist. He had an undergraduate degree in biology, but that soon thereafter he entered into the military and became a, uh, a pilot and was flying around uh, one of these surveillance uh, Orion aircraft. And he just got fed up with it and decided to retire to Finhorn because one day when he went for a free seminar at Finhorn, they taught him how to meditate. And the meditation was just turning his brain radio to a frequency channel that had no static and nobody talking. And to hold that state for as long as he could. And the moment he did that, he started hearing information downloads uh, coming right into as if you're listening to me now, Brian. And they were incredible bits of information that related to the science of what was actually happening at Finhorn. And I'll never forget the most important story that uh, probably has ever been told to me by a sensitive because it can now be verified. In his residence, he had been painting rainbows and he had posted them up, different kinds of rainbows with different colors because there's seven colors in the rainbow, but he had been wanting to meditate as he was painting these, trying to get an extraction of information that he had been given while meditating that related to cancer. But because he was in a, 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 um, a meditation state that was quite deep, and because he had been given the information that related to cancer in that deep state, he was having difficulty translating it into something that he could put down into the English language. And he had been working on it for well over a year. And it took me 30 years to figure out what that bit of information is. And I just gave it to you. That our cells are composed of water, of minerals, and of protein, a special kind of protein, that causes the water to be layered in multiple layers that have opposing charges that can store a limitless amount of information. So basically what we're talking about is that the water is the information battery for the entire body. And I think it won't be too much longer because the science is there that we'll begin to realize that really it's the structured water inside the cells of our body where the mind, where our mind is located. Not the brain, but the mind. Because it can hold from day one our experiences right up until we die at the age of 80 or 75 or wherever. And that water is akin to a rainbow in terms of its frequencies. Um, the frequencies that are in cancer are very chaotic. One of the greatest discoveries of the last uh, 50 years was the MRI, the uh, kind of uh, radio wave x-ray machine that doesn't require the cells to be dead in order to film them as they are in the living state. And uh, back in the 70s, the first inventor of the MRI, his name was Raymond Damadian, he's still alive, uh, he produced what's called the phonar. And he was able to see this unique water that was inside cells and as a result <clears throat> they were able to produce software that could perfectly take that bouncing radio wave off of the body that was being uh, bombarded and produce beautiful films that were crystal clear detail. But when they ran into a cancer tumor, that water signal that came back caused the tumor to be foggy, to be uh, muddled. It was out of focus. And he brought together the two top biophysicists of the, of the day. Raymond, da uh, Raymond, da Raymond Damadian himself was an MD, PhD from Harvard. But his uh, biophysicists were in some ways much brighter than he. Gilbert Endling, probably the greatest cellular physiologist that we've ever produced and uh, one of Raymond Damadian's partners, 
which is Freeman Cope. And he's, Raymond said to him, look, how come we're not taking crystal clear um, images that we can translate with our software of tumors? And they scratched their heads and I said, let us work on it. And that was when they discovered for the first time that the water inside cancer is different than the water inside healthy cells. And bingo, Gilbert and Ling said, what is that about? And if we had paid attention to him, we would have realized that we could have solved the riddle of cancer a long time ago because the wavelengths that come out of the structured water, in this case, radio waves, making a crystal clarity is very similar to a crystal clear rainbow. There are different frequencies. And what this kernel had discovered. Okay, John, we're about to go on another break here. So uh, hang on to those thoughts. They're fascinating. Okay, we'll be back soon. I am Nature. We'll be back in 10 minutes. because they just have so many problems going on with military service only 30 percent were rejected due to um, some sort of impairment or inadequacy today that statistic is over 75 percent of our young men and women are rejected for military service when they present for a physical examination because they just have so many problems going on with them that's a direct result of two things, lack of minerals in the soil that caused this magical tomato, but also the pollutants. Um, I had a chance to correspond with one of the top NIH researchers who reported in one of the uh, publications from his uh, division that dealt with the toxins in our environment that approximately very close to 90% of all cancer in this country is caused from the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. And then take out about 30% of that from cigarette smoke. The rest is at least 50%, 45% is gonna be diet. Both the pollutants that are in the diet, as well as the lack of nutrients that are in the diet. That's what grows really strong Americans. Um, we've homeschooled our kids and they've done exceptionally well. We fed them extremely well. We kept their air clean, their water clean with special filters, and we gave them supplements, and uh, we gave them good mental attitudes about life, good spiritual principles of practicing good moral conduct. And these kids have absolutely thrived. Our family is as tight as could be. This is the same thing that happens in the long living cultures. If anything goes wrong, with anyone, any member of a long living culture, instantly everybody shows up to help out. It doesn't have to be a crisis like the Twin Towers coming down when all the New Yorkers rallied, because that of course brings out the best in everyone as it should. But I'm talking about when somebody is in simple need of something that's fairly urgent to them, everybody cares because they are sensitive they're not only sensitive to, um, to themselves and their families and their neighbors, but also to the land. And some of these phenomena that you mentioned start becoming noticeable to the people that spend a lot of time with it, such as the sensitives that are at Finhorn. This is part of our culture. When our eyes have enough minerals, they can start seeing things that aren't generally available to people that are eating crappy diets. They can start hearing things um, that aren't normally, uh, uh, you know, people paying attention to news reports and TV and Twitter and all that are, are just simply have their attention in the wrong in the wrong direction. Well, as I left off with the last uh, break, before the last break, this colonel had tuned his mind off into a station, so to speak that had nothing, no static going on and, no, and, and his mind was not talking, his brain wasn't talking. And he started getting instant downloads of information. And one of the things that happened to him was he started actually having the experience of going inside a cell of a pine needle of a tree that was right outside his residence when he was just keeping his eyes open without thinking about anything 
and suddenly he had just leapt as if he had zoomed in with a super telescopic lens right into the leaf of the pine needle, uh, right into the cell wall, right into the uh, genetic core of that pine needle. This is how he described it. It took an hour to describe this to, uh, to us. And while he was in, inside where the genes were, where the DNA was, he saw this oscillation, this pulsation. And that's what Gilbert Ling and Freeman Koch and Raymond Damadian were finding at the same time period with their MRI, only this guy was seeing it with his mind, with his form of meditation. And during the process, when he saw this movement in, this wobbling, this very rhythmic movement of DNA in a very particular way, very ordered way, surrounded by water, and it was glistening, and it was producing color frequencies, and it was producing sound frequencies, and he was just getting this downloaded information, suddenly it stopped. And he said, wow, why did it stop? And he got an answer immediately. He said, uh, the first thought he had after he asked the question was, is this what we call cellular immortality, meaning a good thing? And the answer he got back was, no, this is what you call cancer. And that drove him to paint these pictures of a rainbow. Well, when Gilbert Ling um, was to publish this, the polarized multi-layers of water that he proved exist in all life forms, it can be akin to the arrangement of how the Fibonacci and the sacred geometry and how color and sound waves and everything else that's around us that's energy keeps itself in an organized state. And when things get disorganized, when things oscillate in a chaotic manner, because these are frequencies, it gyrates the way in which that the cell expresses itself, such as when toxic metals get inside cells, the enzyme systems fall apart. When the proper minerals are not inside a cell, the enzyme systems work a billion times slower. So how on God's earth can we maintain health if we're mineral deficient, Brian? We can't. And what no, exactly. happened to me... Sorry? No, exactly. Hey, John, I just... Um, we, we're, uh, we're connected to people through our chat room, and, and there's a good question here, and I think you could, it fits in well with our discussion uh, in this magic tomato that you had. Uh, someone is saying they had a similar experience from eating rock lichen. Um, have you heard anything about the power of eating uh, rock lichen? Well, this is an excellent uh, question because when the minerals in the soil run out, they have to come from someplace. And they do it at a very, very slow rate compared to where they originally come from. Where they originally come from are the glaciers. Glaciers are so heavy that when they press down upon rock that has all 80 minerals in them, it pulverizes them into a fine dust flower, what I call rock dust. And this is the purpose of the, of the glaciers. Where these long living people are located is always in the foothills of glaciers, of mountains that have glaciers on them. And every spring, these minerals that are uh, pulverized uh, from the glaciers wind up in this, in this mountain spring water that travels on down the mountains into their farmland that they put back into their soil, back into their plants, and then the animals eat the plants, and then they eat the plants and the animals, and that's how these people do it. With lichen, it's a very slow process. They hang out on the, on the outside of a rock, and they are responsible for breaking down the rock into, um, into tiny pieces of minerals that they can, they can break down, they can ingest. But that's not how the soil bacteria work. The soil bacteria, which is the basis to the food chain, which is the basis to growing regenerative foods like this magic tomato, have to have an enormous amount of pulverized minerals already in the soil because they eat it. And they can't eat the other minerals that exist in larger particle form. They have to have this pulverized, finely, finely micronized mineral dust that does that. And that comes from glaciers or from runoff from the mountain springs during the early summer years. 
And that's why we have only the long living people that live in those remote regions, with the exception that we can do this ourselves. We can buy rock mm -hmm. dust that's been pulverized into this format and we can sprinkle it on our own gardens. And that was one of the things that Finhorn was doing. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yes, and uh, is, am, is it true that lichen is actually a combination of algae and fungus? No, no. Lichen is a particular organism. Uh, some are edible, some are not. Um, and uh, of course they would, like for example, if you went to Klamath Lake in uh, Oregon, southern Oregon, there is a particular kind of algae there, Aphanizelma plus aqua, AFA for short that has a ballast system. And the lake is about seven miles long, but it's only about, oh, 30 feet deep. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, eight feet deep. And at the bottom of this lake, um, eight feet down where the water is, there's 30 feet of this mineral that uh, was caused about 7,000 years ago when the uh, volcanic mountain erupted. Mount Montezuma, I believe, was the name of it. And it formed this rock dust, and it landed in this lake system, and it's still there today. Well, this algae has a ballast system that takes it up and down, up and down, up and down all day long, and it grabs onto those minerals. And so that particular kind of algae, which has a starch cell wall as opposed to a cellulose cell wall that's indigestible from humans, and I suppose that some lichens are ingestible, indigestible for the same reason, um, it becomes 100% uh, re released its nutrients into the human body when it's ingested. And there are lots of people, lots of farmers, I talked to some of the farmers there that harvest this algae, and they report the same thing that this listener reported, that as soon as they put the super gr blue green algae, they call it, into their mouth, they, 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 they use it like chewing tobacco. They stuck it under their tongue and just kind of let it sit there all day long while they were harvesting the, the crop of that year. And it just turned on everything. Their mind was super clear. Their ability to think was super clear. Their energy level was super clear and, and strong. And they could just nonstop make the harvest happen. And that's how people should live. Oh, wow. Beautiful story. So somehow we have to bring this uh, uh, recipe for um, um, nutritional abundance and uh, well, you have a term for food, uh, food power or food, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Food um, bioavailability. What, what's the term you used that, that came out of the study that you did well, comparing the different uh, uh, sources of, um, of edible uh, vegetables and whatnot from these cultures, these superfoods? Yeah, these superfoods. Well, um, l let me let me take it this in this direction because it can be talked about for hours. But when I looked at what all of the long living people were doing, I found that they all practiced four things. They practiced detoxification. They they practiced uh, super oxygenation, maximal oxygenation by the way that they exercised. And they also had a diet that was rich in embryonic food factors which is where you're leading with this. And then the fourth thing was they had unique ways in which they practiced the mentally moral conduct. Uh, universal moral conduct is never doing oneself any harm nor anyone else any harm, always doing good to oneself and always doing good to others and to the best of one's ability with one's resources, helping others, serving others. <clears throat> That's basic moral conduct. <clears throat> you can divide it up from there. Well, when you are living on soil that's depleted, you develop a huge hunger. You get sick, your family, your, your kids don't thrive. You have to go out and conquer new land. So the, probably the greatest agricultural scientist we had up until very recently was William Albrecht of the University of Missouri, who's now passed on. But he, going into World War II, stated that all wars are created by the hidden hunger. Because he was very familiar with this whole entire concept of where the food chain really begins. And you cannot grow a healthy population of people with a topsoil that is used in our farmlands that's completely depleted. We have to get sick. It's the only way that 
you can go with that. The animals get sick, the humans have to get sick, we have to give hormones to animals so they can breed. We have to give hormones to human being, beings that have to, uh, you know, want to have children. Um, and he noticed that when the soil gets so deficient that 25% of the population of the animals could not reproduce, that that was their extinction threshold, that that population of animals was going to rapidly die off. With human beings, when these studies were being uh, ongoing back in the 30s, 1930s, by him, human beings had a, a failure rate in their marriages of reproducing uh, somewhere between 11 and 12 percent. We're now at 18 percent of married couples cannot have children. We're very rapidly headed toward the 25 percent, which has to occur when the soils remain deficient. And the only way to make this properly uh, correct itself has nothing to do with global warming. It has more to do with global cooling. Let me explain. When you look at global warming, what you're looking at is the motor to global cooling. Let me take it another step backwards. Prior to the glaciations that we've had at least 17 known cycles over 1.7 million years, they last about 100,000 years each. We had volcanic activity that was enough because of the core of the earth being hot enough that it released this dust, this rock dust, all over the globe. For example, when Mount Pinatubo in uh, the Philippines erupted uh, several, uh, about a decade ago, it cooled the planet by a full two degrees or a little less than two degrees uh, just by that one eruption because the dust stays up in the air for so long and it scatters across the earth and it recedes it. With Mount Montezuma that I just mentioned about uh, in Klamath Lake in Southern Oregon, that explosion was enough to put rock dust into this lake that grows one of the most potent superfoods of all time. This is the key to the food chain, to the regenerative food chain. It starts with rock dust of the 80 minerals that our cells require, not in terms of what we've recognized yet, but in terms of how they electrically bounce off of each other inside the cells when they're present, but also in the absence of toxins. They have what's called zeta potential. They are full of energy as tiny particles, and they have a relationship with the proteins inside our cells. I'll give you another example. The, uh, the construct of DNA and RNA is that of an antenna. Waveforms go through time and space, not just up and down, but in a spiral. That's DNA. DNA is a double spiral system that's the perfect antenna that can capture these waveforms that are stored in the water of the cell, for example, or coming in afresh from whatever it is that we're experiencing or being bombarded with. Hence, microwave towers and cell phones are causing a lot of brain cancer. The World Health Organization is on to this, but we keep it hush-hush because the economic forces behind it don't want anybody to know that. But it's a big deal. So we need to protect ourselves from uh, EMF pollution. Uh, living too close to high power electrical tension wires. We've known for over 40 years that raises the rate of leukemia and bloodborne cancers, especially in children that have school systems that are perched right next to these high power tension wires. The reason is because it influences the DNA's ability to function properly. It, it can't, it mutates and it causes the wrong expression of the cell, it causes the cell to go rogue. So at any rate, um, the proteins inside the cell that I mentioned at the very beginning, they are single antenna um, extensions. And they, they also uh, are twirls, they also spiral inside the cell. And at the end of the cell, they're very strongly negatively charged. And all these minerals I'm talking to you about, not all of them, but most of them are positively charged. So this positive negative attraction occurs and this resonance, this, this vibration occurs that's very organized and that causes the water inside the cell to become the perfect storage device. And that's what makes healthy cells look so clean 
under MRI and why cancer cells were discovered to be containing chaotic water because they don't have these attributes and they have scattering information and that information turns into wrong information that causes the cancer cell to grow on forever and eat everything in its path. And that's one of the reasons why we're so sick. Last thing I want to say. In 1988, the U.S. Surgeon General stated that 67% of all disease is completely linked to our diet. That was in 1988. In 2004, this NIH researcher that I made mention of just a little while ago came out and said that approximately 90% of all cancer comes from the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. These things are not solvable with present-day technology. An example, when Fukushima blew up, we do not have the technology to clean that up. Toxic metals were going into our food supply at about the same rate that the good minerals were being taken out, never to be returned. And those metals cannot be recollected from the environment. Once they enter into the food chain, our present-day technology cannot take them back out. They stay in. They constantly are recycled. Now, if you make those toxic metals radioactive, you find that those radioactive particles, not only are they toxic because they're heavy metals, but they're toxic because they amplify all other toxicity by tenfold because they upset the vibrations of what's supposed to make the chemistry of life happen inside the cells with these three principles I've been talking to you about. The reason why I want to go into this is because that's the way out, Brian. We have to get the water reorganized inside the cells of our body, and we have 75 trillion cells. Now, imagine the power of this. I said at the beginning of this whole interview that each day at a healthy 25-year-old, in one cell, we have 100,000 mutations or injuries that occur just to the genetic code that we fix within 24 hours. But you've got to multiply that by 75 trillion human cells. That's the power of the regeneration effect within. And that's what the long-living cultures uh, have perfected with their regenerative lifestyle. And that science is what's up on my website. Yeah, I mean, that's what my show's all about, John, is finding solutions. Uh, there's the micro and the macro. Well, you know, we have to try to stay healthy and uh, ward off cancer and all these other nasty uh, diseases that are out there. But we, then the second part is to fight at the ma macro level to deal with these issues and to change, I mean, <laughs> the way we're using our resources. I mean, we don't need uh, military budgets in the U.S. that are far outweigh every other budget. I mean, we're just, man, I mean, we got to turn this money and start using it for useful things. You yeah, agree? I, I, I hear what you're saying. You know, I, I, I do, but let me just say that those of us in the field working to use natural cures for cancer, uh, many of us have read a book called World Without Cancer by Griffin. I recommend it for everyone to make them understand what it is that we're actually up against. We have a group, first of all, banks basically own most of the industry around the world because they make loans to it. The banking system is a, is a unique culprit. We have cronyism. It doesn't matter if you're a conservative or progressive. Cronies will control in the United States what the federal government does and doesn't do. And those cronies are responsible for getting us sick in the first place by way of pollution. But at the same time, those same groups own all the hospital beds by way of stock and shares in those systems. So they get us to get sick and they have us at the other end when we give them all of our money back at the end of our life uh, when we go to die. An example, we spend 70% of our reserve cash the last six months of life fighting off illness. We are enslaved no differently than the serfs were during the middle ages and the banking system is connected to the industries, which is connected to the political systems in a way in which we're not bright enough to take on. 
I say that the best thing for us to do is to learn the regenerative systems of the long living, make a safe haven within our own house, move to areas that are pollution free, and just let the whole system collapse because I, I really, we do not have the technology to fix this. Well, we'll talk about that after the break. I anticipate the uh, break music to kick in any minute, and we'll spend the last um, half hour of our show discussing ways of surviving our uh, incredibly toxic uh, world that um, seems to be spiraling out of control. So, um, yeah, I, um, I agree with you, John. I mean, we really, really have to look at finding ways to protect ourselves, our families. You've done an exquisite job with your family. I'm I'm a big fan of homeschooling kids. Uh, unfortunately, I've never uh, I've never been in a relationship where that could happen. But um, I've I've met so many parents that homeschool kids. They're far they're on average, on average far more aware of what's going on on the planet and all of the issues uh, that we're confronting. They they are feeding their kids organic food. They're aware of uh, all these sorts of um, good practices to maintain health. And um, you know it's. Um, it's the way to go, man. You, I mean, you've done an ex- incredible job. Uh, I have to, you know, I have to congratulate you for being uh, on top of all these incredibly important issues. Thank you, Brian. Okay, well, I'm not sure where the break is, but let's um, let's just move along. Now, this is something. Have you ever heard the process of transmutation? Biological transmutation. Uh, uh, well, it's it's actually. Um, uh, it's a part of Vedic practice, and uh, it's the final stage in, of enlightenment for a yogi or a guru. And what happens is, and, and this g- harkens back to your issue around water and being intelligent and being a receptor of, of many things and a transmitter, these people actually go through a weak process, and they, they consciously die, and they leave behind only their solid uh, par- uh, particles, their minerals and whatnot, and, and they just leave a little statuette, and everything that's in them that's water is gone, and they they go directly to God. Don't you? I find that incredibly fascinating that it's connected to the power of water within us. Oh, here comes a break. Okay. Okay, we'll pick that up. Pick up John after after the Provide you. We just got to put in a word to all the listeners that people like John Apsley are rare. I mean, this guy is just phenomenal. His knowledge base, his experience, his education, his scientific mind. I mean, these are the kinds of people that we need to support, and we need to support the radio station that provides you with this information. So please go to Donate Now or buy some seeds, buy some uh, past programs. It's all there on the uh, website. You, you see the banner ads running at the top. We've got to support this station. We've got to keep it going because this kind of information, folks, is going to save your life. Okay. So, John, let's get back to where we were. And um, uh, we were chatting a bit uh, during the break. You want to get into miraculous healing and uh, something to do with water? Yeah. Uh, we're, you, you mentioned uh, transcendence, I think. Uh, uh, you know, the Transmutation. Ability, uh, Transmutation, transcend. Well, transcendence in the sense that you're talking about attaining, um, going to the higher realms. And let me talk about miraculous healings because I think we can scientifically begin to put our arms around what's going on there. Um, my first scientist that I really understood to be able to discern properly what happens at the cell level during regeneration was Alexis Carell. And back in 1902, he witnessed his first miracle, miraculous healing, that took place from the water at Lourdes in France. And it was with a woman, uh, Marie Bailey, who was uh, approximately 21 years of age, I believe, 23. And she had tubercular peritonitis, and she was in the final hours of her life. Uh, She looked to be about seven months, eight months pregnant from the tuberculosis tumors, not cancer, that were in her stomach. And she was in and out of consciousness. And the moment that that water hit her belly, she had an instant burning that took place that kind of freaked everyone out. There were four doctors at that point 
including Corral, that were watching this, about four nurses as well. And he was furiously taking notes. And she cried out, please more, please more. And so they put more water on her. And within 45 minutes, she was completely cured. Now that's what we call a best case series. That's something that's actually accepted now um, within um, the peer review system, meaning that if you know that there's no chance for someone to make a recovery, and yet they do, then whatever it is that they did, you have to give validity to, because there's nothing known that could have caused that to occur. Um, so Carell wrote about this, and as a result, he was kicked out of France. He had a very promising medical career all lined up for him. He probably would have been one of the heads of the Pasteur Institute because he had figured out how to sew blood vessels together. No one knew how to do that. And he won the Nobel Prize for that about a decade later, but he had already been teaching it, and his, uh, he was teaching anatomy at the medical school in Lyon. But he was kicked out of France for writing about, hey, listen, we need to study this water. We need to find out why this water was involved with this woman healing from a fatal condition who was about ready to expire at that very second. And it was witnessed by not only me, but three other physicians and four other nurses. And we're all trained in this. We're all trained to recognize tubercular peritonitis. Well, they didn't want to hear about it. So he fled to Quebec. And after that, he went to the University of Chicago, which was started by the Rockefellers. And the Rockefeller um, Research Facility uh, in New York eventually got him to join them in 1906. So as he fled and then he wound up, he only spoke French, um, he wound up with some of the greatest American researchers in cellular research that was to eventually lead them at the Rockefeller Institute in New York to be able to do organ transplants. We would not have organ transplants today had not the Rockefeller Institute got a hold of Corral and started him working with the greatest cellular physiologist of the day. And what they were trying to do was to grow healthy, normal tissues or cells indefinitely because they needed to store, they knew that someday they needed to store the full organs before the transplant occurred. And the, so they started at the cell level and they couldn't do it. So for six years, he slaved every single day into the wee hours of the morning trying to figure out how to grow those cells. And although I have everything he's ever written, and I have from his wife his journal that he kept uh, on that miraculous healing that he saw in 1902 for which he was kicked out of France, mm -hmm. he's the only Nobel Prize winner to not only witness one true miraculous healing, but to witness two. In 1908, he returned to France. He returned to Lourdes, and this time, having had doubts arise in his mind that he couldn't possibly have seen what he saw in 1902 because it was just so medically impossible, he witnesses his second miraculous healing. This time, not with the 23-year-old who could have been, as in his mind, you know, creating a pseudo pregnancy with auto suggestion because she was a crazy lady, which she wasn't. She actually lived another 34 years, became a nun, and was uh, regarded as a, a, a completely normal person after that. But this time it was in an 18 month old infant whose eyes had not completely formed and therefore was completely blind. And within a less than a 60 seconds, of that water hitting the baby's eyes, those eyes were completely formed and the baby could see. So he was the first to witness that. Well, he goes back to New York and in 1909, he cannot grow the cells in a healthy state. 1910, he cannot grow the cells in a healthy state. 1911, can't do it. 1912, very frustrated. But in 1912, he asks himself the question, and this is from me, this is from my insight, I could be wrong. But from everything he ever wrote about, from everything I ever saw him involved with, 
looking at how he formed his experimental designs, looking at it from every conceivable angle, I am certain, Brian, that he asked himself this question, where can I get some of that damn water to grow these healthy cells in? Exactly. You got it too, didn't you? That was chilling. That You got some chills there. That's exactly right, Brian. Yeah. He, oh, he yeah. No, the water is alive and it's special. And you, if you right. find a good source, wow, it's, it's right. very powerful. Okay, so these higher realms that you keep wanting to take the conversation into, let me tell you, they're vibrations. They are discernible in every recorded miraculous healing that takes place. They are very scientifically reproducible. They have four different major qualities that the people that witness and experience the miraculous healing will almost always report. The first is bliss or extremely pleasant sensations vibrating throughout the entire body. With extremeness to that, it can be called rapture, the actual experience of rapture, slain in the spirit, it's part of it. Um, a profound, uh, this is second part. Second part, the experience of, a, of the vibration is extreme gratitude. Oh, this is so wonderful. I want everybody to experience this. I am so grateful for this. May all people experience this wonderful thing I'm experiencing. That's the second quality. That's a direct vibration that's experienced within the confines of the human body. The third, tranquility. Profound tranquility. Again, being slain in the spirit, as Christians will, will remark about. Fourth, extreme calmness of mind. In other words, when Marie Bailey first had that water put on her belly, a belly and it caused extreme burning, she remained calm. She said, please more, please more. And the next thing that she reported when the sub subsequent water was put on her belly after the detoxification occurred, which is always heat, by the way, she experienced tremendous peace. Uh, she was in the presence of what she called the Lord. These beings all dwell in those realms that are composed of these vibrations. And only in our water are we constructed in such a way that we can link into those vibratory rates. It's the water. It's where our mind is located. Therefore, the attunement processes of these meditations that are used throughout antiquity, whether it's Christian prayer, whether it's Jewish prayer, whether it's Hindu prayer, whether it's Buddhist prayer, will always deal with sensations at their base, and they are reproducible. They will occur all the time during miraculous healings, and I defy anybody to say otherwise. These are four different, strong, different kinds of vibrations or sensations that everyone will talk about. Well, Profound John, bliss, gratitude, tranquility, and calmness of mind. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, that is just so powerful and beautiful. I am blessed because I experience vibrations every day, uh, some days 20 times, and I associate them with uh, seeing perfection, um, uh, understanding a new truth, um, you know, and uh, perhaps they are healing. Uh, perhaps this is part of the, uh, of the uh, experience, that I'm being healed and, and helped to continue because I believe I'm fighting the good fight. And that the, the, the spirits, the positive spirits out there are encouraging me to keep going. And as are you, John. Well, thank you. And, and this, this has to be the case. Uh, there is a, there, there is a, uh, a past radiologist uh, named Hammer who experienced uh, a, a severe emotional trauma when he was notified that his young son, at the age of 20, had just passed on, had just died. And within just a, a month, he had testicular cancer. And he knew intuitively, Brian, that the shock of that emotional trauma is what brought on his cancer because he's otherwise very healthy. And he figured it out that when they took x-rays, uh, CAT scans of his brain and his entire body, there were these concentric rings that were located in very strategically placed locations in his brain but that he later found out were always there in all cancer patients, as well as the tumor. 
which also have these strange, as I said to you earlier, the water inside cancer cells is chaotic. Well, when the brain has these concentric rings yes. that an MRI can show up, and some CAT scans can also show, that's aberrations of the structured water. Structured water will show up like that. So what he noticed was is that when he figured out a technique to put back in the correct organization to that part of the brain, he didn't know it was water that he was fixing. As soon as that concentric ring structure disappeared on the CAT scan or the MRI, the cancer disappeared. And he formed a new form of medicine called the German New Medicine that has some good following here in Canada as well as the United States. So the water, once it's put back into its pristine organizational state, which is fortified and preserved by the proper minerals with their proper energy structure, the zeta potential, that turns on all the nerve endings when you taste this kind of food that is uh, uh, abundant with it, and relates to this vibratory rate, which is it going in and out, in and out, in and out with the different kinds of proteins and genes. That vibration, by the way, is a frequency, and that's what causes the life chemistry to occur. That's as simple as it is, folks. These vibrations can be felt as sensations. And every human being does it. They're uniform, they're reproducible. And when we attune to the proper frequencies that abound around us, we can attune to those frequencies of, or those sensations first and foremost to enact or to be par participant with the healings that take place. And anyone who travels with us, because we will be traveling to these different locations, these miraculous healing hotspots, for example, um, people will experience these sensations and by way of our other regenerative daily lifestyle practices, I believe that we can enhance this and make sure that these healings that take place are more, much more consistent and much more. Let me give you one last example. At Lourdes, there are 3% documented, medically documented, scientifically documented, true miraculous healings that take place each year. 3%. Of the millions of people that come, there's only 3% that have these complete conversions in terms of their health. About 25% will notice pretty major stuff going on. About 75% total won't notice anything. In Brazil, there is a healing center called the CASA, where closer to more than 50% of the people there experience absolute permanent miraculous healings of various kinds. Things that have been looked at and documented by medical physicians now for decades. Think amazing things. Um, a lot of this on both locations has to do with water. Certainly it has to do with the water inside the body, but it also has to do with the water that's available there lo uh, on location. And so we have this water that comes down from the mountains, from the glaciers, uh, causing a crushing action to micronize the minerals. And as the water travels downstream, it gains zeta potential. The particles of minerals gain energy. And that energy is freely donated into the cells of the plant, or the, starting with the bacteria in the soil, then the plant, then the animals that eat the plant, and the humans that eat both the plants and the animals. And that is what causes this vibratory rate inside each cell of our body to be able to repair all the insults, all the injuries that occur to it each day in one 24-hour cycle until we're about the age of 90, 95, even 100, if we do it properly. But because we have such great pollution occurring because it's profits over health, profits over people now, the business of America is business. We have traded God for the God almighty dollar. And as a result, we're losing it. And I don't see a way to recover from it except for this, Brian. We can rebuild a regenerative lifestyle within the confines of our own homes we have to prove it. We have to make ourselves healthy again. We have to have the discipline to do that. It only requires a, a little bit of discipline each day. I, I have a 55-minute daily program that does it. And then we need to start transforming our local neighborhoods in ways in which that in many cases 
we're simply not going to find the right places in the United States, unfortunately. There's a few places left that still are pristine in terms of the environment. But with 90% of our cancers, and it being the number one disease now, uh, the number one cause of death now in the United States as of this year, at least out, those are the projections, should supersede uh, heart disease. Um, being caused from the environment, 90% from the environment, and because we can't remove those toxins from the environment, there's no way to remediate those. They, the, these toxic metals, for example, is one of them to stay in the food chain. GMO foods is another. The pesticides is another. They alter the genetic oscillations, the genetic structure. P53, P27, P21s are the anti-cancer genes that become permanently damaged by these environmental poisons. So unless we practice these four pillars, which we can do, unless we move or protect our area to, become, to remain pristine uh, so that we don't re-expose ourselves, we ain't gonna win this battle. But if we're smart, we can win the battle. And that will be the Phoenix rising. That's what we have to do. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I, I'm, I'm completely on board. I, I, I just, um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, I think I saw something on your site about uh, mineral supplements. Are, are these helpful? Oh, you're selling them. I hope they are. Yes. You know, uh, right now we've just moved from the West Coast to the East Coast, um, and I'll uh, be setting up um, different uh, facilities uh, where people can come to start the workshops that we're doing. Um, but those that are like yourself, that are already well-educated, uh, there are daily programs that you can put in um, to your own kitchen. And there are mineral supplements that have this high zeta potential state. Uh, there are other mineral supplements that have all 80 trace minerals in them. Uh, one of the places to get them from is to juice from organic foods that are raised in mineral rich soils. That's, that, 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 that's John, uncommon. John, I don't want to interrupt you, but we're going to be uh, commercial very soon. I just want to thank you uh, so much for coming back. I want to get you back on this show or another show very soon. We didn't get into all the topics. I'm going to post your website in the chat room. Uh, but again, for those who are listening now, www.dr.apsley, capital D-R, capital A-P-S-L-E-Y.com. Uh, this guy has the answers that we so desperately need as a people, those that want to survive, those that want to create a new world. I mean, this is our man, or one of the best people out there. So, John, what would you like to say in closing? Oh, just uh, thank you for having me on, and I'll uh, be glad to do this again. And let's uh, let's start rebuilding a regenerative community. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's so fantastic. And that's why, you know, places like Findhorn are so important on this planet. They have created a model that can be replicated many, many times over. Are you going to be offering some of your courses at places like Findhorn? Yes, if they go to my website, they'll see our, our, what our offerings are. Um, we'll have online courses, and then we'll have resident courses where we go to these sacred healing hotspots. And uh, but people can do it in their own kitchens; they don't have to travel anywhere if they have a computer. Yeah, and I, I guess people should be filtering the air coming into their home, filtering their water, things of that sort. All that yeah. stuff's very important. Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow, quite a world we live in, but it's survivable, people. We, 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 we can't give up. Those that want to fight the good fight, like I say, when things do fall apart, we can restart things. Okay, I hear the music coming. Thanks again, John. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.